Good morning. Thanks for staying back. This is, this is great to see everybody here. Um, um, I'm Harish Malkani. I come from a company called Arconic. Uh, for uh, those of you who heard uh, Craig mention, uh, Arconic is a uh, three-month-old company with a 130-year old history. So just keep that in mind. I've been with uh, the company 28 years. My primary role has been to, um, I grew up through the organization doing a lot of process control, process modeling, simulation systems. Um, off late, uh, we've been leading a group of people to drive our uh, smart manufacturing initiative through the company across uh, all the businesses. So, um, so the storyline today really is uh, touching upon several aspects. So I'll give you a brief background on what Arconic does as a business so you have some context uh, for, for what I'm going to talk about. A uh, couple of slides on what our initiative looks like in smart manufacturing, and it touches upon uh, the themes that have been talked about today about ITOT convergence. Um, and that's, that's going to be uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll touch upon. Uh, the other things that I'll speak briefly about are how you know, things go beyond IT and OT convergence. That you're actually talking about multiple disciplines that, that kind of go into this, this field uh, to make it successful. Um, and a couple of other themes around how we see uh, the applications and the use cases essentially drive this, this convergence uh, at all levels and, and uh, you know, uh, result in success uh, in what we've done. And then finally, uh, you know, the, the, the critical question about how a, a company that is 130 years old has equipment that's probably you know, 20, 30, 40 years old as well. So we talk about legacy equipment and how we connect that up to the, to the digital age. So. So the company uh, is, is in uh, three major uh, business sectors. Uh, one is the EPS, which is engineered products. And this is heavily focused on aerospace and automotive uh, applications. You have uh, the uh, power and propulsion business, which provides components for jet engines and uh, gas turbines and so on. We have uh, the, um, uh, I can't see very well from here. The, um, uh, Fastening, fastening systems, which makes um, uh, components for the aerospace industry, particularly for the airplanes, where you have to join things together. Um, we have uh, forgings and extrusions, which make uh, components for various industries, particularly aerospace, automotive, industrial sectors. Uh, these are uh, uh, units that uh, supply a lot of critical components to those, those industries. Uh, we have titanium project, uh, products, which is a new acquisition for us, again, going away from aluminum, going into other uh, lightweight materials to, to supply the, the uh, uh, industries that, that I talked about. Uh, global role products is the business where uh, we have sheet and plate products, primarily made out of aluminum, uh, that is supplying uh, the aerospace and automotive uh, uh, business. We have a new business called the Micromill business, which basically shrinks the flow path uh, of making uh, aluminum sheet from, from a uh, footprint that's a, a mile wide to just about uh, you know, less than an eighth of a mile. Um, and and the, the, it shrinks the, the production uh, flow path significantly. Uh, and then lastly, we have uh, brazing and commercial transportation. So this is where you talk about things like heat exchangers, you talk about uh, uh, sheet that goes on uh, uh, tank trailers and, and things like that. Uh, TCS is the transportation and construction solutions. Uh, you've seen some of the Alcoa wheels on the 18-wheelers that go around on the, on the highway. Uh, you see building and construction products where we make uh, not only frames, uh, aluminum-based frames for doors and windows, but large structures, including the facades that actually go on the outside of the buildings. Um, and then a, a unit back in, uh, in Latin America that supplies mostly uh, uh, construction and industrial applications. Uh, um, so a little bit about what our vision is for uh, automation and smart manufacturing in the company. What I'm showing here is the, the, uh, uh, the famous uh, pyramid that the ISA 95 uh, organization has created. We treat automation as a foundation to what we really want to go after, which is smart manufacturing. So what you see on the left side is the automation side. What you see on the right side is the, what we are calling smart manufacturing. Um, 
what we've done is we've, uh, if you look at the state of maturity in our businesses uh, in, in this particular picture, it ranges from nothing to something very sophisticated. So, so there are businesses that are still implementing a lot of solutions in the automation space. There are other businesses that have actually marched on to what we're calling phase one, which is the information side of uh, smart manufacturing. And there are some businesses that have reached the point where they're actually implementing solutions on the intelligence side. Right? So what do we mean by that? So the automation triangle you're familiar with, but on the information side, the key thing here is to build our systems where we are providing the right data at the right time in the right form to the right people. Right? I always mix the order of that, but, but you get the sense. And we saw some presentations even yesterday where we talked about this particular theme, right? So how do you make data-driven decisions? That's essentially what that is. And that's all about information, right? The value that you derive from information is great, but then when you reach the next level, which is the intelligence level, this is where a lot of proactive actions can result in, in some tremendous value for the, for the business, right? And this is where you make use of that information, and then you use technologies that are in analytics and modeling and simulation and optimization to actually make your systems more proactive and predictive and intelligent, right? So that's really the theme of this. And, and uh, uh, as I said, our businesses are in different states of maturity. What we've got going right now are several pilots. So in about three years or so, we've consolidated this effort and we've driven about 15 different pilots through the company. Uh, that are touching upon various aspects of this, uh, this picture. One of the key things here is on the left-hand side, I've shown infrastructure and security, which kind of goes through all, across all of these layers in, in the automation space. And that's also true on the right-hand side when we talk about information and intelligence. So wh what is our goal? Our goal really is to move from being purely reactive to being proactive, right? And you hear, heard different types of words that have been used uh, in, in this conference. Uh, but when you think about data that you get from your sensing, uh, 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 sensing systems in, in the uh, operations, whether it's the process or the product, um, you really are limited in the types of actions that you can take just from that data. What you have to do is integrate and contextualize that, inf that data into information, right? And then you can actually use that information to drive your control systems. You can take some actions that are more meaningful. Right? So that's the first half of that slide on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is all about how then you move that information into insights. How do you convert that? And that's where the whole area of modeling and analytics comes in. So you've heard many presentations in this conference that has been a main theme about how analytics can drive that. Um, and once you develop those insights, then you can take some, some actions that are moving into that proactive uh, side of things, right? But to really get to the apex of all the stuff is when you convert those insights into intelligence through systems that are meant for providing you with simulation and optimization capabilities, right? And once you've done that, now you've actually completed the picture where you can drive that through an intelligent advanced control system that's actually, you know, by the phrase that I use is, your systems then become self-aware and they become self-optimized, right? That's really the goal uh, of this. Um, one of the things that, that has been very critical for us is that, you know, like I said, the state of maturity was pretty diverse in our businesses in, in this area. And we had teams all over the place. We had uh, some businesses had excellent centers of excellence that were actually driving this process through other businesses did not. And in about three years time frame, we've actually developed a, a fairly strong team that cuts across multiple competencies, as you can see here, including our connections with uh, public private consortiums like the SMLC, the Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition, which is now going to lead the uh, Smart Manufacturing Institute. Uh, we have several other connections like that with, uh, with uh, those types of entities, solution providers that work with us uh, in, in the automation and smart manufacturing space, and then, of course, academia that we, we leverage more, a lot of the advanced modeling analytic solutions through, uh, through those partnerships. So 
the theme of IT OT convergence, um, you know, it's it's central to how we've been successful in this journey, right? If you look at the le the top left of this uh, this diagram here, the traditional automation pyramid, right? It used to be that you had you know, OT was, was primarily driving the bottom layers of this, and IT was driving the, the top layers of it, right? What's happening now is that this, this is sort of converging, and the influence of IT at the bottom layers is quite significant, and vice versa. OT is influencing how that data needs to be uh, driven up the chain and, and made use of, right? And this is my best attempt at coming up with a color that matches, that combines both green and blue. But this also happens to be the Arconic color, so yay for me. Um, the other thing is that when you talk about smart manufacturing, this is where you talk about other disciplines that come into play, right? So it's not just about OT, IT. Now you're talking about computer science merging with physical sciences, and you know you have computer scientists talking to engineers. You're talking about you know people who are mathematicians, people who are you know uh, deep into uh, developing process models for your manufacturing uh, processes and so on and so forth. But the same thing is happening there, right? So you got, you got these two major fields sort of merging into this. And what I showed in the previous slide, there was a reason for it, because a lot of success that I can uh, attribute uh, to is, is the fact that we've actually been able to drive this through our, through our teams. Um, the other theme that I want to touch upon is that when we talk about these pilots that are going across the company, uh, touching upon every aspect of our, our vision, uh, the representation of this cross-functional uh, set of teams, their involvement early in the process is absolutely critical. You know, you can't start with just the ITOT and then move down the path and then say, oh, we did not actually talk to the guys who own the process. We did not talk to the guys who actually know the best about, about the, uh, the process itself. Uh, we didn't talk about procurement. Procurement plays a big role in making those investments, right? So bring those parties together early in the process. And it doesn't have to be everybody. We, you know, we have to be practical as well, right? I mean, you have a room full of people, you'll never get anywhere. But you have to make sure that you have the right representation in that process. And then select the right tools and technologies that are applicable for the problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, so what I've said here on the right, right hand side is the right solution for the right purpose. We heard that theme in some other presentations yesterday as well, and I thought that was, that was a great, uh, great touch point. Um, variations of this particular chart has been, had, have been seen uh, across the conference uh, this time. Uh, but the theme here is that in, in our experience, what we found to work best in terms of what data to collect, how to integrate it, how to contextualize it, and what solutions to provide in this, this uh, uh, smart manufacturing space, the critical part there is that we've actually looked ahead to what the application is, what the problem is that we're trying to solve, and then determine what those layers need to look like. Right, and it has been a tremendous uh, sort of change of thinking, change, uh, you know, a shift in thinking, that has helped us a lot. Um, and so, what I'm showing here is that you have the data at the bottom that's coming from different uh, different uh, sources, and the contextualization is the absolute key thing that needs to happen before you actually start using it for analytics and modeling and uh, all those fancy things, right? Um, and the way we've been able to do that is if you look at those tool sets that are available for analytics and optimization and so on and so forth for a particular application, let that drive what the data is. So we have one example where we, I think this, this is an example that was quoted yesterday also by somebody else. Uh, you know, a, a particular uh, uh, problem in a plant, they said, okay, we've got 145 different tags that we're collecting on this, this processing line. And we want to look at you know, this big data thing uh, using, using all of that stuff. Eventually, when we looked at the problem that they were trying to solve, only about 38 of those were actually critical. And then we put our energy into those 38 and then went through, through that, that uh, uh, infrastructure layer to actually develop the, the necessary solutions. 
Uh, my final point is, is uh, about legacy systems. So as I said, we are a 130-year-old company uh, with a new name in the last, uh, last three months. Uh, we have assets that are there, uh, you know, a large range of them. There are assets that are brand new in the last, you know, five, 10 years. There are assets that are about 30, 40 years old. And uh, in many cases, we have to think about what the best solution is to actually connect these assets to this new, new world, right? And, and of course, the, the obvious one is that if you have a PLC on the floor, you obviously connect it through the PLC or a SCADA system. But what you see now is that because you have devices that are available to you with built-in connectivity, you have this opportunity to actually connect old equipment through that last channel that I'm showing you there. And again, it doesn't have to go through the integrated data layer, like has been talked about before, but now you can actually go straight to the applications that are running in the cloud for things like analytics and, and, and modeling. Um, so what have been our learnings? Um, there are three things that I would, I would say uh, uh, are critical for us. Uh, first, like I said, there's an early engagement. Uh, you know, it really takes a village, and I, I mean it in, 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 in all ways. Uh, the team that I showed you before on that chart, we have about maybe 80 to 90 participants uh, in that team. And then depending on what we are talking about, we sort of pull subsets of it in, in certain competencies. And it has worked extremely well, particularly because all of our businesses that we own in Arconic are very diverse. So the cross-learning that has taken place as a result of that has been just, just fantastic. Uh, let the use case define the uh, uh, data requirements. Uh, I think it was Wayne Gretzky who said that you know a great player goes to where the puck is. Sorry, a good player goes to where the puck is, but a great player goes to where the puck is going to be. Right. Uh, so we've actually taken that seriously, and we actually start with the applications and then let it determine what we want to do with the with the data and infrastructure. And then legacy assets, there's no way we're going to go through a digital transformation without thinking about how to connect the legacy equipment. Very critical. We have businesses that have tons and tons of stuff out there on the floor. Uh, and you know, for them to take part in this digital transformation, it's absolutely critical that we have solutions for connecting those uh, into the new infrastructure. So I think that was my last slide. Thank you for your time.